A giant in Canadian politics has died. Brian Mulroney will go down in history as one of this country's most consequential prime ministers. In the 80s, the Conservative leader led his party to the largest margin of victory in Canadian history. His outsized legacy includes brokering a free trade deal with the U.S. and introducing a national sales tax. Brian Mulroney was 84. Good evening, I'm Chris Glover. Thank you for joining us on such a momentous evening. We're tracking extensive local reaction to Mulroney's death, but we'll begin with Canada's current Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau, saying tonight he was devastated by the news. There are many, many people across the country tonight who are uh, reeling and feeling uh, a deep absence. Uh, he was committed to this country, loved it with all his heart, and served it many, many years in many different ways. And this is video of Trudeau meeting with Mulroney just last year. The pair knew each other well, sharing a deep respect for public service. Tonight, Trudeau highlighting the fact that Mulroney never stopped working for Canadians, while current Conservative federal leader Pierre Polyev called Mulroney one of Canada's greatest ever statesmen, famous for bringing transformational change to Canada, especially through ushering in a new era of free trade. It wasn't electoral success that defined his political career, it was what he did with it. As Prime Minister, he unleashed free enterprise. He crushed inflation. He signed a free, the, one of the most important free trade agreements in the history of the world. And now politicians from every political party, every corner of this country, and every level of politics are putting out statements tonight, including the Premier's. Here's what fellow Conservative Ontario Premier Doug Ford had to say. He became a, a, a mentor to me. He became an advisor to me any time I had a tough decision. But when you, when you talk to Brian, I'm sure many of you uh, have in this room, he boosts you up. Several Toronto city councillors applauding Mulroney's dedication and leadership as well. Toronto Mayor Olivia Chow called the former Prime Minister a champion of the environment. Mulroney's daughter, Caroline, serves as a Conservative MPP for York Simcoe and is the president of Ontario's Treasury Board. She was the one who broke the news of his death this evening. In a statement online, she wrote, On behalf of my mother and our family, it is with great sadness we announce the passing of my father, the Right Honourable Brian Mulroney, Canada's 18th Prime Minister. He died peacefully, surrounded by family, she wrote. She adds, details of funeral arrangements will be announced when they are available. Now, Mulroney's impact on Canada was wide-reaching. For a look back on his life, here's CBC's chief political correspondent, Rosemary Barton. His very first foray into politics to become leader of the Progressive Conservative Party brought him a bitter loss. He channeled that bitterness into another leadership run seven years later. That time, he won handily. And renewed the Progressive Conservative Party of Canada with the largest majority in Canadian history at the time. Brian Mulroney created deep loyalties with those around him in unifying the party. Some of those loyalties were later tested and lost. Mulroney came from the small town of Bécamo on the north shore of the St. Lawrence River. Remote and isolated, he grew up in an Irish Catholic family, the son of an electrician at the local paper mill. But his ordinary upbringing was quickly overtaken by his extraordinary life. A close friendship with then U.S. President Ronald Reagan, what many saw as an attempt to change the relationship between Canada and the United States. And a first step towards a free trade agreement between the two countries, something Mulroney had initially opposed. In fact, free trade became the center point of Mulroney's pivotal second federal election in 1988. Our message is clear. Canada is open for business again. Bitterly fought, it became about Canadian patriotism. You've sold us out. I happen to believe that once you... Mr. Any, Turner, just, what, just, just one second. Second. Once any you nation, do not, ha you do what, not have a monopoly what, on patriotism. What, what, and I resent what, the fact that your what, implication that only you are a Canadian. I, Mulroney won his second majority, leaving him lots of room to move forward with bold and potentially controversial ideas, including bringing in the much-disliked GST. 
We are doing it because it is right for Canada. It must be done. Yet, he still had work to do. If there are not fundamental changes in South Africa, we are prepared to invoke total sanctions against that country and its repressive regime. Pressuring international partners to denounce the apartheid in South Africa and free Nelson Mandela. It won Mulroney worldwide praise and a visit from a grateful and free Mandela just months after his release. Mulroney signed the Acid Rain Accord with the United States in 1991, earning him kudos from environmentalists. But Canada had wearied of Mulroney after a turbulent nine years, and he left politics in 1993. I always tried to do what I thought would be right for Canada in the long term, not what could be politically popular in the short term. His years after politics were marked with some embarrassing legal battles, including questions about his relationship with the German businessman Karl Heinz Schreiber, resulting in an inquiry. Mulroney did admit to accepting a quarter of a million dollars from Schreiber for consulting. I was fighting for my life and the honor of my family. The inquiry found the former prime minister's dealings with Schreiber were inappropriate and not ethical. Mulroney called it the worst mistake of his life and set to rebuild his reputation. Conservatives once again sought his counsel or his blessing, and the liberal successor to his old foe, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, counted on his advice during negotiations around NAFTA 2.0. Mulroney marked the history of this country time and time again. And now in his passing, Canadians may reflect on just how much he gave and how much he changed their country. Rosemary Barton, CBC News, Ottawa. Such an incredible life indeed. We've only scratched the surface of Brian Mulroney's legacy and how he's being remembered tonight. There's much more reaction to his death. Just head to our website, cbc.ca slash news. Turning now to other big stories of the day, and for the second time in two weeks, there's been a fatal shooting in the city's north end. A man was killed in the middle of the day in a busy plaza near Finch and Highway 27. Lane Harrison is live for us tonight at that scene. Hey there, Lane. Police held a press conference there this evening. Walk us through what we've learned. Chris, just before 1 p.m., someone fired a volley of shots into a white Ford SUV, which was just behind me but has since been removed by police. Officers found one man who had been hit, and he was pronounced dead here at the plaza. And police say suspects are still outstanding. Shots rang out during the noon hour at this busy shopping center, with multiple bullet holes visible on the driver's side of this Ford SUV. The area is full of businesses, from restaurants to a physiotherapy clinic and a pharmacy. Somebody said it sounds like firecrackers, and I said, I think that's gunshot, so we keep the door locked until all the police cruisers came. I didn't realize it's gunshot. I thought like someone is trying to break the glass, right? And then I saw people are running around. Police officers tried to save the man's life, but were unsuccessful. They say the suspects, a driver and passenger, sped away in a dark-colored Honda, heading west along Finch Avenue. Police say that car may have damage on its back right side. We are currently using all of our available resources to determine who's responsible, including speaking to a number of witnesses here at the scene and reviewing video. I'm here today to appeal uh, for help from the community to help us determine what happened here. Why the shooting happened is still unclear. Detective Sergeant Al Bartlett couldn't say if it was targeted. It's very early on in the investigation, too early for me to speculate on that. The first report suggested the bullets came from another vehicle, but even that is now uncertain. It's still something that, uh, that we're working on. I can tell you uh, that there was uh, obviously another vehicle involved. Police also wouldn't reveal any information about the man who died, but they did say he did not shoot back. Many of those going about their day in the plaza say the shootings left them on edge. It's pretty scary, like happening during the daytime. It's like you hear some of these things happening late at night, but not during you know lunchtime while you're sitting at a Starbucks. So it's a bit scary. Chris, as you can see behind me, there are still a lot of cars behind the police tape. Some of them belonging to people who parked here to access a hospital that's just up the road. Now, people have been coming up to officers all night asking when they might be able to get their vehicles back. They're being told to call police to find out when that will be possible. Chris? All right, Lane, thank you for the update. Lane Harrison reporting live for us tonight.
Now across town in Scarborough, another active police investigation to tell you about. A 76-year-old woman is recovering after being shot in the face with a pellet gun. Police say the woman was attacked while out for a walk in her neighborhood yesterday, and they're still looking for the suspect. Greg Ross has the details on that story. It happened here on Hupfield Trail in Scarborough in broad daylight. The suspect approached from behind and uh, came around to the, uh, the victim, facing the victim face on, and then shot her in the hand and face with what appears to be a pellet gun. The victim was a 76-year-old woman who went for a walk in her neighborhood. Police say it happened between 10.30 and 11 o'clock yesterday morning. It doesn't appear to be targeted at this time. It does appear to be random. Police say the suspect fled the scene in an unknown direction. The victim showed up here at Mary Shad Public School looking for help. She was shaking. She's afraid. Furman Villanueva works as a crossing guard at the school. He says the woman asked him for help. When I saw her, she's bloody, so I helped her give her um, tissue to wipe her blood. He says she had injuries on her face and one of her hands. He drove her to her house. Police say she later went to get treatment for her injuries. The victim was taken to hospital, sustained non-life-threatening injuries, and is now resting at home. Police have released this image of the suspect. The person was wearing a long gray jacket with a black mask. Knowing this person is still out there is concerning for some residents. It is scary because I, and I cancel my shift also because I'm scared now. I never seen this kind of thing happen around here because this is very quiet neighborhood. Police are asking anyone in the area with security cameras or dash cams to check their footage yesterday morning to see if they may have captured the suspect before or after this incident. Greg Ross, CBC News, Toronto. And in the downtown, one person is dead following a fight outside one of the city's warming centers on Tuesday. It happened just before 2 a.m. in front of the Respite Center at 75 Elizabeth Street. Police say they received reports of an altercation and one person was arrested. The Elizabeth Street Warming Center is one of four operated by the city for people experiencing homelessness. They open when temperatures reach minus 5 degrees or below. And police are asking for the public's help in an animal cruelty investigation after the remains of a dog were found by someone walking along a trail. And at that time they found uh, what appeared to be a, gra a green garbage bag. The uh, garbage bag contained um, what looks like a deceased animal. This animal looked like it was emaciated and malnourished. In the Morningside and Danzig area, the dog is believed to be an American bulldog mix and was light brown in color with white markings. If you saw anything suspicious, contact police. Hey there, welcome back. The final phase of redevelopment at the Center for Addiction and Mental Health is officially underway. The province is investing $1.6 billion to support the construction of two new buildings at its Queen Street West campus. The first is a secure care and recovery building, a modern facility designed with to provide care for individuals with mental illness who have come into contact with the law. The second is the Discovery Centre, a state-of-the-art, world-class research enterprise that accelerates our understanding and treatment of mental illness. The groundbreaking ceremony was held today. Now, once completed, the buildings will house more beds and family visitation areas. They'll also have enclosed outdoor areas to support recovery, along with enhanced security and building support services. A Toronto hospital is opening a new service for people experiencing mental health emergencies. North York General Hospital is expected to open the space next week. As Tyler Cheese shows us, it's bringing a new approach to dealing with people who have mental health and substance use challenges. This can be a place of solace, uh, a place where um, conversations can happen. It's called the Purple Zone. A brand new section of North York General Hospital's emergency room dedicated to those experiencing a mental health crisis. This kind of a place is, is uh, uh, a huge step um, towards providing like, more human-centered care uh, with um, the, the noise and distractions removed with uh, trauma-informed features in the building. Everything in the Purple Zone rooms, from the beds to the color of the walls, have been designed with the needs of mental health patients in mind. 
Patient advocates say that's a big step up from what was available before. We have conversations with people uh, pushing back against stigma, uh, especially self-stigma, and uh, hopefully inspiring them to uh, that this isn't the end, that this is just another stop along the way. But to have that conversation in the middle of a busy emergency department with the, the machines beeping all over them, the entire spectrum of human emotion in front of you, that's an uphill climb. I was hallucinating. I was uh, paranoid. I wasn't getting any sleep. Um, I, I thought people were talking about me. This man is a former patient of the hospital who sought medical attention while suffering severe depression four years ago. He says he wishes the Purple Zone was available to him back then. That would have been phenomenal because I was afraid to admit my mental condition. But with the privacy like this room, you're one-on-one -on -one with the doctor or the therapist and you can open up and you can feel freer to, to get more uh, out in, in how you're suffering. The idea to have a separate area for mental health emergencies isn't new, but the staff here say the Purple Zone offers a unique model of care. This is actually going to be led by nurses with mental health background. Uh, we've also um, taught them some skills around medical assessments, so the patients can have their medical and mental health assessment all at the same time. The unit has also partnered with community agencies to ensure patients continue to receive the care they need when they leave. Those agencies include addiction services and an organization that provides shelter for homeless youth. Tyler Cheese, CBC News, Toronto. Welcome back. It's been four years since we've been able to say today is February 29th, and for some people, the leap year means they've been waiting four years to have a birthday. Lane Harrison met up with some of them to see how they feel about their big day. Brandon Miller might look like any other criminal lawyer working away in his office with shelves of books and hard-earned diplomas on the wall. But would you believe me if I told you this man is celebrating his 10th birthday today? It's one of these things where you finally have crested the hill into the double digits. It's uh, a big uh, milestone in terms of my life. Now most people say, oh, you're 40, and I don't look at it that way, I'm 10. Miller was born on a leap day, an extra day that shows up on the calendar only once every four years. He plans to celebrate accordingly. I'm going to do it as a 10-year-old would. We're going to have a pizza party with donuts and balloons and a bunch of friends and uh, make it an age-appropriate party. Miller is dedicated to the bit. Just ask him if his party will have a theme. Ninja Turtles. <laughs> Meanwhile, in Burlington, Dwayne Warner will be celebrating his 20th birthday and turning 80 years old. Growing up, his father made sure everyone knew when he was born. He'd always introduce me, you know, he's born on February 29th, you know, which means he can collect family allowance until he's 18 and then switch over to old age pension. As infrequent as they are, he likes to make the most of his special day. I try and use my birthday uh, as a way to um, not only raise a little bit of money for other things, but also to have people understand that they should all do this. This year, he's asking for donations to help sponsor refugees and for a school for vulnerable youth in Honduras. If you know a lot about astrology, when exactly you were born means more to you than to others. We came here to the rock store to find out what traits this year's Leap Day babies might have. Samantha Chin, better known as Lady Samantha, is the owner of the rock store. She's also an astrologist who regularly holds readings. So on this particular year, the sun will conjoin with the planet Saturn. So children that are born with a sun and Saturn together will have more of a tendency to be, um, take on responsibility more. They might feel like they're older from a younger age or more mature. She says these new Leap Day babies will tend to weigh all the risks before making a big decision. So it's a good thing they'll have four years to plan each birthday. Lane Harrison, CBC News, Toronto. All right, and looking live at our city, it's a bit of a chilly night to be celebrating for all our Leap Day babies. The temperature right now, minus four, feeling like minus nine. But uh, Colette, this quick cold snap isn't lasting too long as we head into March tomorrow.
Yes, well, we're starting a new month tomorrow, Chris. And by the way, obviously, February 29th, uh, happy birthday to all our leap year babies. But as we're starting a new month of March, and I know this season, anything but typical with it being an El Nino winter, but let's look at what a typical March uh, would be like. And that's taking a, a looking at 30 years of climate data. So the average daytime high for Toronto, and this is for the city, five degrees. And again, it's going to be cooler that average at the beginning of the month and then warmer towards the end as we're getting closer to April. But if we average that out throughout five degrees, average daytime low minus two, <laughs> you know, six days where the temperature will be above 10 degrees, just into the first probably I don't know, week or so of March, we could be getting very close to that already as I look at the trend ahead and uh, just over 50 millimeters of rainfall would be typical. All right, here's where we're at in between two systems. So losing some of the snow squalls, uh, a chance maybe to melt a bit of snow coming our way as the milder air moves in, but also sunshine through the day tomorrow. Late day clouds begin to build into southwestern Ontario. Those eventually will be making their way around the Golden Horseshoe as well. And then showers to follow. Pretty light stuff. And the tracking of this again kind of keeps most of the moisture south of the border, but just a glancing blow uh, into southwestern Ontario. Ontario and through the GTA. So Saturday morning could see some wet roadways and then the cloud cover will linger, um, but at least it becomes drier as we head through the day on Saturday and it will still be mild. So it's not just tomorrow, that milder air is going to be sticking around and building towards the beginning of next week, being aided by the southerly winds, uh, again, kind of picking up later in the day tomorrow. Still some cool readings, especially in Eastern Ontario uh, overnight tonight. So tomorrow morning, still a bit chilly, still looking at a wind chill factor, minus eight, minus nine uh, in the city, but then eight degrees, much more comfortable Friday, showers overnight into Saturday, and then there we go, uh, back into some of these double digits coming our way, Chris. Not bad, all right, thank you, Colette. And finally, tonight, athletes competing at the Paris Olympics now have a place to stay. The Athletes' Village has officially been inaugurated. It'll host about 14,000 athletes before welcoming 9,000 for the Paralympics. Thank you so much for watching us. That's it for us tonight. I'll be back with you tomorrow night at 11. We'll see you then.